So as we look at, as, as we go through this today, um, it's kind of random because in a, in a group this size, there's people who are like seriously having a conversation about thinking about getting married. And then there's people who have not really had much dating experience. And I'm going to start by taking about five plus minutes and kind of talking, because a lot of you are thinking about ministry. I'm going to talk a little bit just briefly about marriage ministry in the church, which sounds random because you guys, you know, none of you are married. But I think it's important to understand that how key it is. Um, so much of, I believe, God's plan for families is that marriage w marriages would thrive. Still looking for stuff? No more. Uh, more than 50 things? Oh. This might be the one that we messed up on and we didn't make enough. So how many need one? And I'll, I'll get it to you because I'm not going to, I'm going to deal she with this later. So one, one for now. two. He's not going to be at this class. Who's not? Isn't there an extra one sitting in this area? Huh? Is she coming? Yeah. Okay. So we need three. You won't need it for this one. I just passed them out, you know, quick and then I'll get it. To, but, so I'll get them to you. Um, anyway, so, but I want to talk a little bit about about the power of, of um, marriage kind of at a 10,000 foot level and then we'll kind of talk about it even we'll meddle in your life and stuff. So if you look at your, at your notes, you're gonna have the, the notes that are kind of the notes that'll come up here. If you look at this, um, here's the values of a, of a strong family ministry. So in, a, in the church, it used to be just youth ministry, now we kind of look at family ministry and, and the values are strong marriages, competent parents, empowered kids, healthy leaders. So we're looking today at strong marriages. And um, so just quickly, um, I want to tell you about the 1% factor. So Homeward, I work at Homeward. You could go to our, our website and see it. about a million people a day come to Homeward's website. Fascinating enough. hundred and I guess last week we had 111 countries come because there's like blogs and things that people like to see. We sent out 7 million e-blasts, things like that. And um, But anyway, the fascinating side to it is if at Homeward, where I work, if we could take the divorce rate down by 1%, we could save 1.5 million kids a year from going into a divorced family. Okay? Now, that divorce happens. I mean, that's just, it just does. I'm not saying, how many of you come from, your, your parents divorced? How many in here? Yeah, so not half of you, but, you know, quite a few. So, I mean, you know, life goes on. I mean, it's, it's complicated, and I totally get it, and I'm not here to talk so much about divorce, but just to simply say that kids who are, mar who are in homes where their parents are married and actually like each other do a lot better than kids who have gone through divorce. That doesn't, some of my best friends have, are, are from families where there's divorce, okay? My family wasn't divorced. All three of my brothers got a divorce, but my parents weren't, but you know, they didn't help in terms of the marriage thing, so there's lots of complications. But the 1% factor is something I live with. I think about that on a regular basis. Um, how do I help one marriage, you know, go from, um, you know, going crazy or going downhill to, to thriving. And so that's an important factor for me. Um, so I want to show you this video. I'm going to ask you about it afterwards. Can you see it okay from the back?
watching that film, what do you what do you think about? What, any 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 thoughts? Heartbreak. Heartbreak at the beginning, and then it turns, but it's heartbreaking. You're, it was interesting to watch. I I stood back there because I wanted to watch you all, and it was like, uh, did anybody feel that was their story a little bit? Anybody have that in, in terms of their own life? It's funny, I didn't even have that with my parents, but I felt that that was sometimes my story because that sort of happened at times, um, you know, with, with me. So the reason I show you that story is because that's the 1%. Now, interesting, on the side, so I was a part of helping kind of put that together and whatnot, and when we filmed the part of the guy leaving, these are actors, okay, and the woman started crying. And we had to go, God, we can't. I'm not me, because I'm not the director. But go, God, we got to stop it. She goes, this is, I can't do this. This is my life. This was my parents. This was my dad. And so then they go, Jim, you need to talk to her. So we have to go aside. And I'm having this conversation with her. Who's, she's just bawling. I mean, this is a really pretty lady who's you know, kind of middle class, you know, blah, 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 doing her thing. But it just, it, it was, here was a woman who had kids. And I don't know what her experience was with her own marriage, but she was going back to the time when her dad left and said he would, you know, call in two weeks and he never called. You know, and he came in, you know, came in and out. The reason I show you that is because I want that to be your goal. I want the, the second part to be your goal. And it doesn't happen by circumstance and chance. And actually, some of the decisions you make now, before you get married, um, help play out that thing. So I'm just gonna spend a couple of moments more on what the church can do, just to kind of help you think through this, but there's some cool things that the church can do. First of all, the church should be talking about how to know if you're in love and talking about purity and, and you know boundaries and some of the things we talked about. That happens in youth group. So if a person really wants a good start, they're gonna have to figure that piece out and the church should be teaching them that. Then. Um, you got to talk about getting ready for marriage. Here's a very fascinating thing. Listen to this. 31% better chance if people have premarital counseling or premarital education than if they don't. Is that amazing? That study is actually done in Oklahoma, in the state of Oklahoma. So there are states in the country, there's five of them now, and it'll go hopefully more, but there are five states that will give you a free marriage license if you get counseling. And if that could motivate Think about this, if it could motivate a thousand people, it'll motivate more than that, but if it could motivate a thousand people to go get premarital counseling, it's gonna help like crazy. So please do not get married without premarital counseling. Even if you're seriously dating as time goes on, you know, get the help that you need to figure out if the relationship is, is good or not good. First few years of marriage. So I have a book called The First Few Years of Marriage, and what we're saying is, is that, do you know, anybody know what age or how many years um, is the average length of a first marriage? Five. Yeah, you're close, four. W w w used to, people used to say seven because there was a movie by Marilyn Monroe called The Seven Year Itch. Totally a movie, it was made up, it's not the thing, but studies say that if you can make it four years, you're gonna do better. And it's, it's remarkable, it's almost like weird, like doo doo, that at four years is the big, is the big thing. So, you got to work on the issues of the first few years, and nobody does because they're all, you know, they're busy. Then refreshing your marriage constantly, and churches need to be doing this. I know that the church here is doing a, a marriage conference um, this week, and that's cool that they do that. Give these people, what can the church offer? Well, marriage mentoring, counseling, conferences, seminars, small groups, all that stuff, okay? So again, I only put that in front of you to kind of give you a, a vision that some of you may end up, you know, going into some type of family ministry. If, you know, I did youth ministry, but all of us then realized we needed to, that's what we needed to, to do, is we needed to help the whole family. So I still wake up in the morning, my background is youth ministry, thinking about kids. How do I help kids? For me, the most effective way to help kids is what I'm going to do Sunday night when I talk about sex, and actually talk about pornography um, to these parents, because I want to equip the parents, because I'm not there. I'm their youth pastor type, and I'm there for a bit, and then I'm gone. But parents have the most influential you know, say in it, if you would. And so they can help their, their, their kids. So if I said to you, um, hey, I'm going back to California. I'm going to be in Dana Point. Why don't you come with me just for Thanksgiving? Actually, I'm going to be here, but just for, to say, come back just for the week. I'll pay for everything, and you can kind of hang out with us, and then we'll, you know, we'll send you back here. Um, and you went, OK, I'll come. When we get on the plane, the, the, the flight attendant says, 
there is a 50% chance that this plane could crash. How many of you would still get on the plane? <laughs> Anybody? Okay, no, I mean, you're gonna get on a plane for that. Well, the fact is, is that today's uh, marriage, when you get married, there's about a 50% chance that you get a divorce unless you put some things into practice. So think about that. People are getting married, and the reason they get that statistic is because just two years ago, we don't have last year's, two years ago, 2.1 marriage, uh, 2.1 million marriages in America, and there were 900,000 divorces. So sometimes those are like second marriages and stuff, so it's not exactly 50%, but that's what they call it, okay? So, of course we would, but there's some things you can do right now to help prepare yourself for a, mu a much more successful marriage. So I'm gonna give you five questions. This is if you're seriously dating, and again, most of you aren't seriously dating, but if you're seriously dating, or if, and I know there are some. So if you're seriously dating or even thinking about marriage, here would be the questions. Question number one, are you ready are you willing to work on premarital education? It's exactly what I just said. Are you willing to do it? A lot of people say they are, but they get busy with, a, with one day party. So think about any of your friends who've gotten married, if you have friends who've gotten married. What are they focusing on? They're focusing on the one day event. So important, so key. I don't even remember now what that one day event was about, but we put so much energy into it. But are people also putting that energy into what's gonna take a lifetime, so I've been married 48 years, I could either be miserable or not, I'm not miserable, but I could either be miserable or not because of, of not putting any energy or effort into it. So it's, it takes work to have a good relationship. Work is not bad, okay? And I'm not, you know, I talked yesterday about fun. Well, of course you have to have fun in that, but you also, ha you have to be willing to do the premarital education stuff, the premarital counseling and whatnot. Now I have papers everywhere all flying over, I'm stepping up. Second one is, are you willing to hear, and I talked about this yesterday, willing to hear from your relational community. So if your mom goes, this is not good, or if your best friend goes, I'm worried about you and this guy or this girl, you gotta listen to them. That doesn't mean that they're right, but way too many times we ignore some of the um, flags, and I'm gonna talk about flags in a minute, we ignore some of the flags, so you gotta listen to your relational community. What do they think? You ask them what they think. Thirdly, is are you willing to honestly look at those red flags? So what are some of the red flags? Hmm. Okay, glad you asked. Addiction is a red flag. Are you really gonna marry somebody who's an addict? Make sure that they get through, I mean, there are people who are addicts who get better, but you don't wanna marry somebody who is an addict. You just, and I'm not talking about somebody who's like living out, I mean, hopefully you all wouldn't marry somebody who's a total, you know, pothead or whatever, but if they have an addiction, that addiction is taking away, intimacy is connection. And it's taking away the connection that they have with you because they're more in love with that addiction than they are with you, okay? And when I'm saying addictions, I'm talking about addictions to most anything, okay? So let's take pornography, for example. Most of the people in this room have seen pornography. You saw it at age 11. Um, that's, what the, that, that's what the factor is. So I wouldn't marry somebody who, isn't, who hasn't worked through that. Does that mean that they don't have a pass? Does that mean that they, haven't, that they have never seen? No, you're not gonna find anybody pretty much who hasn't seen pornography anymore or experienced pornography. But that's the case with addiction. Abuse. Now again, one out of three of the women in this room have been sexually abused. So say the statistics. Okay, one out of three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. So you know, there's you know, four or five people in this room. So, so again, if they work through some of their abuse issues, they'll still have a hole in their heart and some pain, but they can work through it. We know that, there's, there's great hope. But if they haven't worked through it, like I do in premarital counseling, one of the first things I go is, what kind of baggage are you bringing into the relationship? They go, oh, I was with this girl or I was with this guy. But when somebody puts up the flag of, I was abused by my uncle when I was seven, then all things stop, because I want to know, has she worked through that? Frankly, has he worked through that, if it's a you know, man or a woman? So abuse is a biggie, okay? Unfaithfulness. So you've been in a relationship with somebody and they've been unfaithful to you and it doesn't have to mean that they were like in the arms physically with another person, if that's the case, red flag. But even if they're, you know, they're just kind of flirting around with that. You know, do you really wanna be in a relationship where they're not all in? Cohabitation. Here's an interesting one and I'll talk about it in a little bit more in a moment, but cohabitation. So your generation cohabitates. My generation didn't. I mean, I was raised in the 70s. I mean, we cohabitated. There were people who cohabitated. People had premarital 
1974, long before you were a spark in your parents' eyes, 75% of America said that they would not live with someone before instead of marriage. Today, 74% say that they would live with someone before instead of marriage. Okay, so let's say that, and a lot of your friends will do that, believe me, okay? So if that's the case, here's what the statistics say. Number one, that when they get married, there is a greater chance of divorce, quite a bit. This is secular statistics, not Christian statistics. Secondly, that there is a greater chance of adultery in the marriage. I mean, they've already been somewhat unfaithful to whatever their values were, especially you all, okay? Thirdly, is that they have less sexual satisfaction, which blows my mind, because I'm like, well, they've been practicing, but they actually have less sexual satisfaction. I could give you a list of 35 things, okay? The point that I'm saying is, this is the secular world. So you live in a world where Christians are the minority and say, you know what, wait until marriage, okay? But the fascinating thing is, is that the secular world knows these statistics. These are their statistics, but they're not gonna tell you that because the reason they're not gonna tell you that is because if they tell you that, then they're not cool. And so a lot of people say, well, it'll not happen to me. Well, frankly, statistics say it will happen to you if that's what you choose to do. So again, to me, that's a red flag. So if they're living together, it's a red flag. Sexual activity, pregnancy, and, you know, people get married because of pregnancy, or different, uh, different spiritual values, poor communication and conflict skills, unresolved issues with a previous spouse or relationship. So, you know, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about second marriages, but one of the reasons second marriages don't last as long as first marriages is because they have unresolved issues, okay? Or they do the same thing that they had done before, okay? So the fourth thing is, are you willing to be brutally honest about your own brokenness? There isn't one person in this room who doesn't have some brokenness. And are you willing to be brutally honest to your you know, future spouse? And I don't think you do that on the first date. It's not like you go, okay, well, let me tell you about my abuse and my addictions and my blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. But I do think it's important along the way to be brutally honest about your own brokenness. I watch, uh, and Kathy and I, in, in some ways, we didn't know what we were talking, doing because nobody told us this stuff. But when we, before we got married, we had had a, quite a few come to Jesus stories about life. I knew her sin bent. She knew my sin bent. And that's why you don't want to jump into marriage too quick. That's why you, you, you know, the idea of dating each other and getting to know each other is really, 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 really um, a good idea. Because, you know, then you begin to see them. You have those moments. But, you know, if you're, um, you, you have the, the camp. I'm going to call Anchor House here the camp. You have the camp romance. Well, you know what? There are people who would go to uh, one of these kinds of things and then they get married, you know, like three weeks after, you know, the deal. Not a smart idea because this is not the real world, okay? They haven't dealt with finances. They haven't dealt with some of the struggles that they're going to deal with. So you got to, you know, you got to experience some of that stuff. So again, are you brutally honest about your own brokenness? And then are you ready for unconditional commitment, which means a lifetime commitment? Um, you know, in Europe today, you can sign a prenup that you would be committed for three years, four years, or seven years. What that says right then and there, that's kind of weird. I mean, I realize most people, I hope, in Europe don't do it that way, but you can. It's legal, see, to get married for three, four, or seven years. Like it's a prenup, so, so it means they're committed for, I'm, I com you know, like we say, are you committed for the rest of your life, and there's places in Europe within liberal churches that would say, are you committed for the next four years? Are you committed for the next seven years? Well, that plays a whole different ball game. I mean, there have been seasons in my marriage where I'd like go, I would love to run from this right now, but because I made a commitment to God, my family, my spouse, I'm not gonna do that, see? But, you know, it kind of takes the, the unconditional commitment out. So that's a question, you know, for you. If you're, not going, if you're going, hey, I'm marrying this person for, for their potential, Dump that idea, okay? Because they're not, they may never get better. I'd say that some of the sin bent in my life and in Kathy's life, and uh, you'll meet Kathy tomorrow, she's coming tomorrow, but you'll meet, but, you know, and, and some of the habits and things like that, they're still there, okay? Um, we're trying to get them baptized and, and, you know, walk with Jesus better and all that, and we do, but they bounce back, whatever they are. So, you know, you got to get to know, um, are you willing to have this unconditional commitment with them? So it's a good question. Anybody want to talk about those five? Anybody have a question about it? I don't want to go too fast on this. Yeah. Can you talk about uh, red flags? Yeah. Specifically in marriage, how about the dating area? 
What, you mean time? Oh, dating. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's, you know, there's, there's different types of dating. And a more intense date, you know, we date because we want to see if that's the person we're going to marry. That's why we date. I mean, you can date for fun. And you can, I mean, like you guys are having um, what I would call inclusive dates. You know, three or four of you go to Eden Coffee, and there's a guy and a girl, two girls. And, you know, and it's not really, I mean, you're, you're, that's a date, actually. You're going to Eden Coffee to very expensive, fancy, uh, you know, food truck. Um, trailer, whatever. Um, that's different than when you're dating intensely about are we going to get married. So kind of what you've been talking about, Noah, in terms of this, you know, woman who, who you're dealing with. So with those, I mean, you can't get to know somebody in a short time period. So it really doesn't work. Most of the time it doesn't work if somebody, you know, you're in infatuation. There's a stage. It's called the infatuation stage. Oh, I just think she's, you know, so, I mean, when I first you know, it was with Kathy. I just love everything about, she even burped and I thought it was funny. I love her burp. You know, she has the cutest hair. She has the cutest eyes. She has this. Oh, she's, it's, she's so funny when she, when she laughs and, and she's this and that. Well, then after a while, I'm like, you know, I think she has bad breath today. You know, do I still love her during bad breath? Do I love her when she's late? Do I love her when she's moody? Do I love her when she's on her period? You know, I'm, I came from a family with all boys and my mom had a hysterectomy. So I didn't even know what that part of life was and then I had my wife and my three daughters and I'm like I am leaving and once a month because they were all on the same deal and I was like these are they've turned in they were the most beautiful people who turned into like you know zombies or something so I had to go do I still love them because love is more unconditional right so I think it takes time to go through those phases really I say to people that if you haven't been in a phase that you're going I wonder if he really is the one, or I wonder if she really is the one. If you haven't gone through that phase, keep dating, <laughs> okay? Because you need that phase. Like for me, we went, a, I studied at the University of Mexico. So Kathy and I kind of broke up and she immediately got a boyfriend, which just drove me nuts. I'm still feeling bad about it 50 years later. And uh, he's tall, dark, and handsome, and you're looking at me. And I went to Mexico, and that's when I really decided I wanted to marry her. Because I said to her, I think we should break up for the summer. And she's like, no. I mean, she didn't want to. She didn't have the same feeling I did. And then we break up because of me, and then she starts dating this other guy. Um, and then when I came back, we got engaged. But it was because I knew that I was willing to give up some of the things that I hadn't been willing to give up before, okay, for her, okay. And um, so anyway, I think that, so I think on the dating thing, you can't, nobody should ever, if you ever hear anybody go, you have to five months. You have to date for 2.9 years. They're full of baloney. It's the longer you can be in a, in a dating type relationship, um, in some ways, I'm not saying for years and years, this is ridiculous when it goes on too long, but when you're, when you're, it, there should be a length of time that you're, you've moved from just kind of dating casually to dating more seriously with the intent to either go this way or not. And when you're in that, you've got to be in it for a while. But I, can't, I, I wish I could give you a, you know, a number, and I can't. Now, this is an interesting thing. You, n <laughs> nobody ever so thinks about true. this. In-laws, you actually married their family. I never thought about that, but what we find is that you actually marry their family. So when I married Kathy, I actually married into, some, to a, into a pretty dysfunctional family, okay? And I just went, great, we're not going to see them. They live in Fresno. No offense to Fresno, but I live in Southern California. Kathy lives in Southern California. We're hardly ever going to see them. Oh, no. We had to go up there for Christmas Eve. Uh, the dad got sick, and we're up there, and, you know, we're, we're intermingling. And so you've got to understand what, what, this is not good or bad. This is just drawing you closer. You have to understand their family system and their family of origin. So I can't help you with what I would do if I was in a group with premarital type people is I would have them fill out this next sheet. The sheet is in your, is in your notes. It's going to be better than here. I don't even know if we have it. Oh, 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 that's another video. Let's watch this video. Then I'll come to this. This is on the in-laws. I love this video.
just a dumb, you know, little video. Oh, there I am. Um, but what I want to do is I want to help you kind of think through the family of origin. And to do that, I'm only going to focus on you, okay? So you've got a sheet of paper in there, and it has kind of like what we call um, the family map, okay? So everybody see it? Does everybody have that copy? You don't have all, everybody, some of these people don't have the questions, but they have the, the copy, okay. So I want you to start with your, this, you don't have to pay attention to how this goes, except what I'm looking for is I'm looking for you to kind of start with your grandmother and your grandfather, okay? So if you were gonna put, and you could do it like even on a side or something, but your grandfather and your grandmother, and then you go to your mom and dad, and if you have step parents, you know, step parents, things like that. If you wanna do aunts and uncles things, I'm not gonna have you do the whole thing right now. But I want you to write these words down. Marriages and divorces. Because let's say that you see you're from a long line of divorce, there's a greater chance you could get a divorce unless you really play into this, okay? Marriages, divorces. Um, if you can, put when they died. Huh? If, like, say, grandma died. Not that, you know, some of your grandmas are, you know, alive and kicking. Um, if there's any kind of depression, mental illness, alcoholism. If there's any kind of conflict with the law. <laughs> and what are their meaningful spiritual experiences? Like in my family, I wouldn't have seen a whole lot of meaningful spiritual experiences. Um, and Kathy's wouldn't have had a lot of meaningful spiritual experiences. And that helped us understand what we we're you know, getting into. Now, I could go through a lot of other issues, um, but I'll just, I'll just take those for a moment. So, what were those again? okay, uh, marriages and divorces. Let, let's say you go, hey, you know what, my, you know, my parents were, have been divorced nine times. That is going to play into your life. Um, death, um, alcoholism, mental illness, depression. Ser you know, I missed this one, but seri serious medical problems, conflict with the law, meaningful spiritual experiences. I think that's the ones I named. Now, what you would do with another person, because there's a couple of you who are in this more serious mode, what you would want to do is you would want to take your family map, and then you would put his or her family map, and, you, and, you, and they would answer that, and then you'd start talking about it. What's interesting is in premarital counseling, this becomes the piece that we talk about for six times. I mean, we're talking about other things, but then it always brings up, oh, yeah, like, you know, this and that. Um, and again, none of this is bad. It's just putting the two families, what are the two families going to look like together? Okay. So I'm going to do that with, yeah. Um, how important is it that the family of your significant other is a Christian? Yeah. Well, it, it doesn't mean that you, it's, it's one issue in many issues. So if your family of that, like for example with Kathy, Kathy's family wasn't Christian. My family wasn't either. So when we got married, we didn't have the background of role models of how to, how, when they're in conflict or when, when they're having their problems or when something happens, how did, you know, a, a Christian family would typically go to the Lord and, you know, take, you know, get some counsel from church and, you know, church was helping them, but it wasn't a part of our life. So we didn't have the skills to know how to do that. So we actually had to learn that because we were first generation. That doesn't mean that I shouldn't have married Kathy. She's an incredible person. She was a Christ follower. She wanted, she felt called into ministry. Um, she has to put up with me because, you know, there's travel and there's all these other kind of things that she has to deal with. But it didn't make it, we, we, I had to realize she doesn't have a flipping clue how to help her kids grow spiritually, my kids grow spiritually, and she doesn't know how to be spiritually intimate with me because she's never seen that. If you're from a family where you've seen some of that, you go, oh, that's how you do it. See what I'm saying? So it makes it more difficult, but I wouldn't say that you, you know, you're, you can't marry somebody like you would buy a horse. Let me see your teeth. You know, let me see, you know, how, how, you know, how are those arms? You, know, you just don't do it that, not that teeth, uh, horses have arms, but you see what I'm saying? So it's, it's one piece to the puzzle, but you've got to know ahead of time what you're getting into. In a perfect world, yeah, it'd be cool to do that. Mental illness is key to see that, because a lot of mental illness is actually um, hereditary. So let's say, for example, that you had a 
parent who is schizophrenic. A lot of times, right about the time you're getting married is when you begin to see schizophrenia. You don't typically see schizophrenia with kids. So, you know, between 20 and 30, a lot of times is when it manifests itself. Sometimes younger, you know, sometimes older. So you, you just want to be aware of the fact that that's there. Does that mean that like every, like in my family, my dad was an alcoholic. That doesn't mean I'm an alcoholic, okay? But it could be, you know. Kathy doesn't have any alcoholism in her, in her family system, so she probably would never be an alcoholic. She could have a glass of wine and she'll fall asleep. She's not gonna get, she just doesn't have the same, you know, background as I do. But mental illness is possible. I, um, but it doesn't, we can't be afraid of that. We have the God part and everything else. But if you were marrying somebody who has a tendency to have some mental illness, or you had the mental illness, then you have to realize that that is, could be the elephant in the room if you don't work through it. They've got to know about it. Talk about brokenness, you've got to say, okay, are you willing to, to marry me even though I have you know, these issues? Or am I willing to marry you even if, the, you know, what are those issues? It's like when you see on a pill box, you, t or you have to take you know, amoxicillin for, you, know, you had a bad cold or something, and, or bad, your flu or whatever. And, um, and, and it has all the serious side effects. Well, you've got to know what the serious side effects are. So this is where, you know, this is not, um, this is an art. It's not science in some ways. The art part goes, wait, I'm in love with this person, and they have this, or I have this. Can we make it happen? And they're, sure you can. There's some pretty amazing marriages with people who have some issues. My, my wife married, her brother married a woman from France and they got a divorce, but, and they weren't Christ followers and on and on. But part of the issue was they were so infatuated with each other and they totally you know, were sleeping together before they got married and whatnot. But come to find out, her cultural, cultural, cultural differences were so different than his. He grows up in Fresno, California. She grows up in Paris, France. Man, that was, that was like strike two already just because of the way that they viewed life. This is making, I mean, I'm making this way too scientific and some of you are like, wait, I thought this was just like, you know, we're, we, you know, we see this person, we fall in love and everything's cool and now I'm talking about <laughs> mental health, illness and things. But, but though the thing, I, this is more for you to do later, but it is something to think about. And what I'm saying is if you're going to be in a relationship with um, someone, by all means, um, you know, know their family map just like they should know your family map. And part of that is just what you do in premarital. The other thing I would say is, your job is to honor your extended family. So my job, even though I, to be honest, I didn't like Kathy's family all that well, but my job was to honor them. Why? Because I honored Kathy. So she needed me to be, I needed to be the, there, you know, there's four siblings. I needed to be the, you know, cheerleader to the mom. I, the mom just thought I was like, cool, I love this. She thought I was so cool, and yet she had no filter. And, um, and she talked bad about all of us, I'm sure. But my job was to be cool to her, not because I was trying to get her attention, but because I wanted to honor Kathy. And I think that's how you do it, okay? Anything else on the, on the family thing? Great question. Yeah, great. Yeah. 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 It's not heredity, but there's a lot of, all of a sudden, when you're talking about physiological, um, <laughs> you're, no, you can't. So if you, if, uh, uh, if the adopted, you know, if, if the adopted, like in our situation, our Christy is adopted, our oldest. So her, her birth mother, Christy is going to have more of the qualities on the, on the mental side and physical side and things of her birth mother, not ours. Is she going to imitate us? Yeah, there are times when Christy is exactly us, but she's she doesn't that doesn't come from physiological heredity, so it's harder with an adopted. You know, when it's just one more factor in the in in the place. So Christy, so Christy, um, so so Rick uh, marries Christy and Steve. Okay, um, we're very excited to be here by Sunday. They're like, can't we come earlier? You know, they want to come. So Christy, um, when they went through premarital counseling. 
anybody who's adopted has what we call abandonment issues. Because even in their, they, they, they love their birth family or whatever, but they're kind of like sometimes going, in their heart, they're like, God, why did my birth mother give me up? There's obviously, like for Christy's case, there's really good reasons. I don't think she has like major things. But if a guy would break up with her, like in high school, she would like freak out more than others. And it was partly because of the abandonment thing, you know? You know, why don't you love me or accept me or whatever? She had to do some counseling for that. Well, that adopted issue is not a psychological issue or, I mean, a physiological issue. It's a psychological issue. You bring that up. But there'll be things in an adopted family on your mom's side that you're not going to be able to figure out. I have a question. Would you put down stuff that people did before they're Christian and they're yeah, no longer Yeah, sure. On the, on the physiological side, yeah. Not, not oh, just oh, like, oh, just like addiction or stuff like that. Um, I, would, I would sure make a note of that because... Um, it is possible that if, say, somebody has certain person, let's say a family of a divorce, I'm saying this and this sounds terrible because I'm not, we're going to get to better stuff here, but if a family, if you come from a family of divorce, there's a greater chance that you'll get a divorce. Well, that has nothing to do with the physiological, that's just that that's the model. So that's, an, you know, that, so yeah, I would put that down. Again, I wouldn't play as much into factor. Christ makes a difference in marriages. So Kathy and I, when we t do our marriage conferences, you know, a lot of times we'll say, hey, we're standing here because of what Christ has done for us, okay? But it's not only, I mean, Christians get divorces. Christians hate each other. Christians, you know, do all kinds of, you know, silly stuff. So it, there is a difference on the Christian factor. That's why I bring up the, the spiritual heritage, if you would, okay? Okay, let's go to the next one. And the next one I'm gonna spend very little time on because I've already done it, actually. Um, but it, it's communication. So what happens is when you look at this, you know, communication's a learn trait, you saw, I'm not even going to show you that one. We'll go past it. It's not that funny. So I was teaching the finance. Now let's go to finances. 26% of marriages that derail, derail because of um, not agreeing on finances. It, you could have poor people who have this. You could have rich people who have this. So if you're going to get married, I'm looking at a couple who are thinking about getting married. I think it's very important. I won't marry, I won't do premarital. I, I, you know, I do a whole session on finances and I'll go, here's the deal. I'm not going to meet with you until you hand me your budget. I could care less how much you make. I could care less, you know, I just want you to have a budget, okay? Because what we see is that marriages where people have a budget, and again, it could be a really low budget and you could live, you know, in a tent, or it could be a really high budget and you could live in a home overlooking the ocean. I don't care. All I care about is that they have a budget and that they actually are going to live by a budget because there's a much greater chance that they'll make it in their marriage if they have the practical side of the budget, okay? Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, and it's funny that you would bring that up because somebody asked me personally, I would go, you know what? The people do better when they, uh, you know, when they merge their bank account. I don't think you do that before marriage, but I think you do that after marriage. I don't know why people need a, another bank account. Some people, like my daughter, one of my daughters has a separate bank account and it's tied to our bank. And so we see it. And it's like, it's always low. And this woman makes an amazing amount of money. She has a master's in business from USC and Southern California. And her husband, you know, sold a business at 30 for seven figures. So they have a lot of money. But this other piece, I think it's like, it, it hurts their marriage. But, you know, I'm the adult. I mean, I, she's the adult and I'm the parent, so I'm, I can't tell her. So simple, workable plan. So make a budget, stick to it. Deal with your debt. Some of, you're at an interesting stage, many of you in life. A lot of people who say they've just graduated from college, they have so much debt that they're going into a marriage is you've got to work through your debt because debt causes people to have, you know, some pretty deep arguments and things like that. So you've got to deal with your debt, make sure that everybody knows, your, you know, what's going on way before you decide to get married. Delayed gratification is a good thing and you've got to get on the same page. So delayed gratification means if you go, I see, a, I see a couple of electric bikes down there and I know somebody who bought an electric bike for 1,700 bucks, but they bought it on um, payments. And so the electric bike became a $3,000 bike um, because it was gonna cost them $3,000. They bought two, husband and wife, they're already married. And so they invested $6,000, but they don't like their electric bikes. So they kind of wasted that money. They should have delayed it, waited to see if they had 1,700 bucks to pay for that, or was there $1,700 they could do something else with, see? And then, you know, try to get on the same page. People who are on the same page financially do, of course, a lot better. And then give and save. I tell people give 10%, save 10%. I don't care if you make hardly any money, 
give 10%, save 10%. Or if you, you know, are wealthy, give maybe more than 10%, save more than 10%. Okay. But, you know, Kathy and I started that really young. Uh, we weren't making a whole lot of money, but we started giving a percent. We actually have, because we, we you know, humbly and gratefully to God, we've made a lot of money. I mean, I have some best-selling books that pay for my life. And, and as a speaker, not at Anchor House, but at other things, as a speaker, you know, there's, I make money. I mean, I'm the president of an organization, too. I mean, that's why we, we aren't poor. We're not crying poor. But that means that we should give more, that we should save more. See? And so, again, in the process, when you're younger, if you get into that habit, it's a really good habit. People who, ha who do stewardship well uh, do well in their marriage. Now, what did I say? What was the percent of marriages that derail because of this one thing? 26%. Okay, so it's a huge thing with marriage counseling. Here's one. This is kind of fun. Again, I'm, I'm kind of using some of the, oh, 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 move, move Jim. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'm wearing the same shirt when I go preach on Sunday. Um, but anyway, the point that I'm saying here is, which for you to see that, is that you've got to have that discussion because, you know, the guy honestly thought that a woman could get a $15 haircut at Supercuts. You can't even get a $15 haircut at Supercuts anymore. What is a $15 thing? But he was willing to spend 100 bucks on his dog or on golf or whatever it might be for his clients. So again, have that conversation before you're even engaged is a great idea, but once you're engaged, you've got to have these kind of conversations, okay? So I think what I'm going to do is at 11, I mean, because I, you know, when we come back, when I come back, um, I want to talk about the other parts to it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sexuality, yeah, and, um, and then spirituality and, uh, you know, that'll be a good conversation. And then be sure and bring or keep with you wherever you're at because you've got somebody else coming in here in a minute. But when that happens, bring uh, those 50 questions are some great questions. I make people kind of go through those questions before, be, hopefully before they get engaged. Um, and, the, and they're not going to be any surprise to you because they're all dealing with the stuff that I've been dealing with. We've got just a few minutes. Why don't we, uh, why don't, anybody want to talk about that? Even talk about the finance side? It's something that we don't practically think about when you're just dating somebody, you know, but it is key. Or anything else? Anybody want to just throw something out? Yeah. So you for doing like finance stuff, do you think you can have like some person like outside the relationship help you? Totally. In fact, I suggest to people that that's a really good idea to have somebody who's already done it do that. So what I do, when I'm doing premarital counseling, I hand them a sheet that's a budget. It doesn't, they don't have to use my sheet. They can find another one online, but if it's comfortable for them, then they do it. But if they need help, like I was with a couple a while back 
And the girl, the, the woman, who was pretty naive about finances, she had no idea that you had to pay for trash pickup and different utility things. And um, he had a cable, he was living in an apartment with some guys, but he, he really loves watching sports and his cable thing was 270 bucks a month. And she's like, why? I mean, she honestly didn't know, I mean, she wasn't, a, and she's actually a really neat person, I'm throwing her under the bus. But there was just like those two things, she had no idea. So sometimes people go, we don't know how to do a budget. A person like myself or others, they, they could help you do that in moments. Um, in terms of how do you how do you do that budget, and basically it's how much do you make, and how much are you going to spend, and you make you you whatever you make you spend less than you make, duh, and it works. But people don't think that way. Well, it's what we call enabling dependency. So I can help. Let's pretend it's me who was going to help you think through the finances you and your spouse or spouse to be. Um, I can, if I do it for you, then I'm enabling dependency. I didn't help you do it, okay? So, so Noah, and it's all Noah's fault, he's enabling dependence. Me, I am totally dependent on him. I look to see if he's here because I don't know how to turn on this stupid thing. And then I see him click the deal. I know I've got some other backups in here, but, you know, so I, he's, you know, if I would have to go, okay, how do you do this? How do you do that? Well, that's the best way to teach somebody how to do finances and then fill in the blank for a lot of other things is to help them by working through, you know, not, not doing it for them. Like for me, I would say, here's a budget, do it. And, and they'd go, and there's, it's blank at utilities. And I'd go, well, you gotta find out how much your utilities are. I'd hand it back to them. How do you find out how much you're, well, you've been paying for it or your parents have been paying for it, ask them. Well, it, shouldn't, it doesn't have to scare your future spouse. They're not in love with their grandparents. They're in love with you. But who your grandparents are and how they acted helps, uh, or what they did or what their issues are or whatever, it does play a determining factor in who you are. Now, now let's take, for example, in my life, my, my, because they weren't Christian, I actually, you know, Kathy was getting a better deal because I was like, I am going to be the transitional generation. I am not going to follow my grandparents. I'm going to go this way. And so, cool. So that would be you. So I don't know what your grandparents' story is, but um, you know, let's say there are multiple divorces, or there's some kind of a other, you know, there's the alcohol, or there's you know, no Christian values, whatever, whatever. Well, they have to take all of that into consideration, but they're also looking at you, and you go, wow, I, you know, look at what she's done with her life compared to what they've done. But it does play a factor. So when the Bible says that you inherit the sins of a previous generation to the third and fourth generation. That doesn't mean that you're going to have the same sins. It means you're going to have the same bent toward that sin sometimes. And so with that, like for us, we put a stake in the ground and we said we're going to be the transitional generation. We're going to recover and, and not repeat. I said that already. So that's, that, that shouldn't scare. Grandma and grandpa shouldn't be scaring whoever you're going to be hanging out with. But they should know what's going on in that family. That's a yellow flag. It's so, it's so easy to be taught that. So it's a yellow flag. If there's a lack of discipline, poor choices, the list goes on, that is. Let's say that you were, let's say you're not materialistic and you marry somebody who's like totally materialistic. I mean, they want to have the nicest clothes. They want to have the nicest purses. They want to, you know, get their hair done at the fanciest places and all that. Then you have to decide are you willing to live with that? Because it's probably not like they're going to go, oh, you know what, I don't want to, I want to start wearing, you know, just shorts and a t-shirt like you do. I'm making this up. Oh, you're not even in, yeah, okay. And that, who cares? I mean, that doesn't matter. But like, for, say for me, with Kathy, she was in a, she, she was raised, oh, well, I told you where she lived, in your, in your neck of the woods. It's in a poor neighborhood. So she didn't have a lot of money. So she didn't, there was no, it, in her mind, there was no thought that we would one day have to decide if we're going to drive an Audi or not. Or she felt embarrassed at, she didn't want, we had an argument over a refrigerator because I wanted 
I came from a family where there's a little more money, so I wanted to have ice, uh, like an ice maker. She goes, that's $300 more. You know, we could say, we don't, you know, we should have just a regular refrigerator when we first got married. I'm like, no, we're gonna spend $300 more. She's like, ah. So I had just the opposite, but I think there are a lot of times there are people who have a different way of living, a different lifestyle. And don't think that you can change them. That, I mean, you might, but I, I wouldn't think that you could change them. Well, you can't change them. Yeah. No, right. I mean, to, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to bounce off of kind of Keith's question was, uh, did your relationship with your grandparents matter as, like, as far as the whole, like, family tree thing? It, it matters, but it doesn't matter as much as other aspects of it. So, you know, relationships with your grandparents, they're part of who you are. They, they believe it or not, they sort of, they, they come from your blood heritage. They maybe look like you. They maybe have the same issues when you're, uh, you know, like my grandpa died of, of a heart attack. So I just had, at Homeward, we have a key man physical every year. So we have a policy on me that if I died, Homeward, you know, gets like $4 million. Um, so I have to do a, a, a thing. And so the guy this time, and I'm, my heart's great. But he focused on my grandpa who died of a heart attack. How old was your grandpa? What, you know, did he smoke? Did he, you know, what was his, what were his habits? Things like that. So yeah, but again, you're, it goes, your, the, your parents influence you too, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be just like your parents. Okay. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pick this back up when we talk about sexuality. <laughs>